Hey everybody, this is John Buck back with another Continuous Time Linear Systems video. This video assumes you've already watched the video on finding the frequency response from differential equations. Uh, we're moving on while we found that frequency response to show an example of applying it to the input using the eigenfunction property. Okay, so if you haven't watched that first video, pause this one, go back and watch that one first, but uh, then we'll, uh, uh, then, then you can catch up with us here. So again, as we saw in the last video, for this example, dy dt plus ay of t equals b times dx dt, simple first order differential equation, we found that h of j omega was a high pass filter with frequency response that looked, uh, that's j b omega over j omega plus a. And then when we sketched this, we found that the, uh, the frequency response, the asymptote was a approximate, very approximate, non-ideal high pass filter where as omega goes to infinity, the gain is b, and as omega goes to, to uh, zero, the gain is zero, and at omega equals a is the half power point between. Right, so just for a moment, hopping back to this page, right? we had zero at zero frequency, gain of b at high frequency, and omega equals a, the role of a in the equation was to tell us what frequency was the half power point, when we were gonna uh, sort of use that as a, a so it's sort of arbitrary, but we don't have any better way for an ideal filter to say that's the point at which we're 3 dB down in power, or that we're sort of making the, starting to make the serious transition from the, the high frequencies that get through the filter with a constant gain and the low frequencies that are attenuated. Okay, so let's go back to our system and see what happens when we apply this to a specific input. So imagine our input is cosine of 100 AT. And we want to find the output for this. Again, we, you know, good to start practicing even now, developing your intuition. If we look at that frequency, you know, for this signal, the frequency is 100 times A. So pause for a moment and think about, well, how do I expect this, what do I expect to happen to this cosine in general? Right, when omega is, is 100 times A, that means I'm 100, way above that half power frequency. I expect the gain to be approximately B, right? If I flip back to that plot on the previous page, I'm way up here, much, much higher than A. I expect the gain to be about B. Now let's, you know, it's always a good engineering practice to think about what happens at high frequencies, low frequencies, to predict how we think something's going to behave, and then go through the math and see if our intuition is right and try and learn from that. So let's do that now. Let's go through the math and see what we actually get when we go step by step with the equations and see if our intuition is right that we'll just get a gain of B. Well, the first step in doing this, to, to make this easier, I'm going to break x of t into the two eigenfunctions so that I can use the, the, the equation right here. I'm going to say this is going to be, that cosine would be 1 half times e to the j, 100 a t, plus 1 half e to the minus j, 100 a t. And I know but students in my class are thinking, there's Buck again, always with the Eulers, but it does get you through the day here. Right? It makes your life a lot easier to just break this up and look at these one at a time. You can also think what, I, what I've done here effectively is, is like found the Fourier series for this signal, just saying that, you know, in this case, omega is 100A. <clears throat> and so this is my, my fundamental. There's only one frequency. And so this would be like A sub 1 and A sub minus 1, if you want to go that way. But for this simple input, we, don't, we can just sort of use the eigenfunction property for now and, and worry about doing more of the formal Fourier series approach when we have more terms or more complicated signals. All right, so if we do this, then we say, well, we're going to need to look at the output we know is going to be y of t is going to be scaled by the eigenfunctions. So, right, our output will take this form. We have each of these same exponentials and still have the half, but each one gets scaled by the gain at omega equals 100. These are 100a, just to make it clear, these are a's here. So I need to go find that h of j equals 100a, and it'll turn out to be symmetric. I'll only really need to find it once here. So to do that, I'm going to plug in omega equals 100a into this equation, and I'll bring that down here and show you what I get. Right, so I get this equation here, and again, right away I see I've got a's everywhere that I can cancel out in this equation, so let me do that. And now it's time for a little engineering approximation. In theory, you know, I want to divide these two complex numbers. I'd normally do that in polar form put them into magnitude phase and, and do things like that. But I can also look at this and say, look, this, this, well, the numerator is just an imaginary number. The denominator is, you know, 100 parts imaginary to one part real. 
Like if I were going to sketch this, maybe it's useful to make a little picture here on the complex plane of what this number is. And we'll see sort of that if we can, in an engineering sense, say to 99% accuracy, this may as well be J times 100. Right, so if I think about this point as a point on the complex plane, it's got a real part of one, an imaginary part of 100. And in fact, this isn't even close to scale, right? In fact, you know, you can see this is really only about roughly eight or nine to one. It should really be like way up here. And it's so close to imaginary that we can ignore that real part. If I turn this into polar form, the phase would still be very, very close to pi over two. And so in an engineering sense, we're gonna say this is approximately, that this one is negligible. And so this is approximately J times 100B over J times 100. And so I can cancel the J100s out. And then I'll say I'll be, in an engineering sense, this filter is very close to a gain of B. And the same thing would happen at minus 100. I just have minus, minus 100A. So these would both be negatives, and they would cancel out. So I, I'll get the same thing for, for the minus. Right, so if both plus minus 100 are approximately B, I can plug those back into my equation for Y of T here, for, for this term up here. Let me mark this. Right, so I'm going to put this B in for this H here, and I'll put this B in for that H there, and then I can simplify Y of T. Right, so when I do that, I get one, one half B e to the J 100 A T plus a half B e to the minus J 100 T. Again, Euler's is my friend, looking at this, I've got one half, right, the same amplitude and I'm adding exponentials. So this would be, if I factor it out front, B over two times two cosine 100 AT. If we sort of break the Euler's down a little bit, some people by now are willing to just go right to the B cosine with the halves there. And that more power to you if you can jump there. But I wanted to make clear where these steps come from. And so my output, as our intuition expected, is the same frequency as the input, but scaled by B. Right, so that's the gain of B we expected. So that's our first case. Let me uh, switch to a new page and let's look at it at the other extreme. What if we have something where the frequency is much lower than that half power point? Well, uh, if X2 of T is, is cosine of, say it's A over 100 T, so 100 times smaller than the half power point, we wanna find the output Y2 of T. Probably good to, let me copy H over here because we'll need that again. Okay, but now we're just we're going to start from the same place. We're going to break this x of t. We're going to follow basically the same process. Oh, but first we should practice our intuition. So let's go back to the uh, the previous page to find the graph and think about well, what do we expect is going to come out of this? If we look at the graph, or pause for a minute and, and pause the video and think about what you expect the output to be, and then let's let's see. Well, you know we're going to be way down here. We expect the gain to be pretty close to zero. That this rather than being scaled by B coming out, it's gonna be something much, much smaller than B close to zero is our intuition. But now let's go through, and as, as we do, we're trying to develop this practice or this habit of try to guess what's going to happen to build our intuition, and then go through step by step and see how well it works. And so our next step, right, is to break my input up like this into the, uh, using the cosine, using Euler's so I can write it out the output in terms of the frequency response here again. So I'm gonna do that same thing on the next page, except all these 100 A's will be A over 100 because that's the frequency for the new example. Okay, so I've broken the input into the sum of two eigenfunctions. And so my output will be the same eigenfunctions scaled by the same one half, but each one with the frequency response evaluated at omega equals A over 100. Okay, so now I've got just as I did on the previous page, my output is the same input scaled by the frequency responses. So clearly I need to find the next step is to, to plug in omega equals a, into a, a over 100 into my equation up here to find the frequency response gains for each eigenfunction. So when I do that, I get the same thing here. And what do you think my next step is? You've seen this story a few times already. Right, noticing there's a's everywhere in this term I can factor out. So once I write it this way, it's clear I can <clears throat> pull out these A's. And I'll get J times B over 100 in the numerator. And in the denominator, I'll have one plus J over 100. And so now looking at this, I wanna simplify it. And again, if it were 
If the two terms in the denominator were roughly the same size, I'd put it in polar form. Like if they were within a factor of 10 of each other, I'd probably put it in polar form and work it out carefully on my calculator or something like that. But again, I can look at like just in a, in a real imaginary plot of this and see this is essentially just one. And right, again, so here I've drawn this, this denominator represented as, as a point in the complex plane is one for the real part and one over 100 for the imaginary part. And the way I've drawn it here, this is about 10 to 1. It should really be 100 to 1. So that, like the, this point should be so close to the line, the real axis, that you can't tell it apart. So we're going to say this is essentially approximately JB over 100. So we can simplify it this way. And when I think about the negative frequency, pretty much everything will be the same, except I'll get the opposite sign here. I'll get minus JB over 100. Right? The on the numerator, I'll have the opposite sign. The denominator will still be 1. This point would be like 1 one hundredth below the line, but it still may as well be 1. So I'm not going to work that all through in detail. You can do that on your own, but it, it's the same process. So already thinking back to the first example, I see two things going on here, right, that I get. Uh, I am getting much, much less than the B I had before. I'm getting B over 100. This is like 100 times smaller uh, than, than the gain I had before. And I have this J here. So I've got something going on with phase, right? I've got an imaginary part to the gain now. So let, when we plug this into my equation up here for Y, let's see what that results in. Right, so plugging in the values for H that I solved for, you know, plugging this value in for here, and this value in for here, I get this equation. And so I can factor you know, the b over 100 out. And I'm going to have j times e to the j, and I'm going to have a minus this. So let me, let me do that and get it more into a form where it's easier to see where Euler's is going. So pulling all the common terms out in front, which maybe is a good idea when we're, when we're still a little bit uh, shaky on our, our Euler's, particularly for working with the complex numbers, I get a jb over 2 times 100. So I have e to the j something minus e to the minus j something, and I know what's going on in there is 2j times the sum. Okay, so using our Euler's, I get 2j sine here, and I can, can plug that in. I have the 2's will cancel. Well, let me, let me not do too much at once. Let me plug that in and then cancel things. So now if I look at this, I have the 2's cancel, and the j's multiply together to make a, a minus 1. Right? So I have this 2 cancel that 2, and this j times j becomes j squared, which is minus 1. And so I'm left with minus b over 100 times negative sine of that. So in terms of amplitude, our intuition was right. That this is pretty, you know, before we got a gain of b out, now this is 100 times smaller. So that would be 40 dB down from the, the, the cosine I put in a minute ago. That if we did, when we get to, in a few weeks, we'll be talking more about dB and Bode plots. But the other thing that happened is, is, is that we haven't talked about yet, and we'll see more later, is the phase of the frequency response has actually changed the cosine into minus the sine. So it's still oscillating with the same frequency, but it's now <clears throat> been, been phase shifted into becoming negative sine at time t. So the output would have a phase shift relative to the input, but it would also be really, really quiet. If these were sounds, it'd be almost hard to hear one for the other. One would, the, the 100 at would be so much louder than this. Okay, so that's uh, following through the example of when I look at two, two single frequency inputs going through this differential equation, we can get an idea of how they're going to behave, especially if it's easier to work this out for frequencies way above and way below the half power point. So again, this is a pretty long video, but I wanted to take everything step by step and so people could pause and review it if they, if they needed uh, to see where different steps happened in the math. Okay, and I just realized I didn't note that, Jay. Right, again, so these two j's became j squared is minus 1 is where this negative sign came from. All right, so I'm going to stop here for today. I've gone on plenty long enough. Uh, that's all for this time, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks.